believe that so many of the mistakes that came out of the great financial crisis and so many of the other mistakes that have beset both companies and countries in recent years have occurred because of tunnel vision and a lack of lateral vision, or as I call it, anthrovision. When the pandemic hit in 2020, there was a lot of discussion about life post-pandemic, the building back better um, issues. And I believe passionately that to build back better, we don't just need policy debate or gazillions of dollars of stimulus or things like that. We also need to change the way that policymakers, business leaders, financiers, any executive actually thinks and looks at the world around them. And in a nutshell, people need to move from tunnel vision to lateral vision. The late 20th century was marked by a time when we created these fantastic intellectual tools to navigate the world, like economic models, like corporate balance sheets, like big data sets, and they are all brilliant and useful. Let me stress that. But they're limited because you can only use them effectively if you look at context, if you look at the wider environment and culture and issues like that, particularly where that context is changing. And right now the context is changing and so I say we need to look beyond just narrow tunnel vision models and actually try and look at the wider environment we're operating in. A core message of the book is that social science, anthropology, needs to be combined with medical science, computer science, economic science, to really create an effective new way of building back better and looking at the world. And what's happened with the pandemic is a classic example of that, because to fix a pandemic, you definitely need brilliant medical science. The geniuses who came out and collaborated with the vaccines did an incredible service to humanity. But what we learned in the pandemic is that medicine alone doesn't work unless you also understand the social and cultural context and the incentives shaping people. Because you can have all the vaccines in the world, but if you can't persuade a population to take them, then you can't beat a pandemic. And over in the UK, Gus O'Donnell, the former head of the British Civil Service, lamented the fact that although the UK government had devised its policy on the back of medical science, it took a very long time for the UK to get ahead of the pandemic because it didn't look at the social science component, how humans behave. Or to take a more positive example, if you look at why masks are so effective, one way to explain that is because the physical fabric stops germs. Another equally important way to explain it is because the act of putting on a mask is a powerful psychological prompt that reminds people to change their behaviour. And it's also a group signaling device that tells people, other people and yourself, that you're adhering to civic norms. And that is incredibly important in a pandemic. We've known that actually from anthropology for a long time in Asia, and if only Western leaders had not been so full of hubris and learnt lessons from Asia earlier on, we probably could have beaten the pandemic a lot earlier. When COVID-19 started, there were social scientists and doctors who said, we have to learn the lessons from Ebola, as well as from SARS in Asia, and apply them to how we devise pandemic policy in the West. Now, in some cases, the lessons were learned. The way that New Yorkers were persuaded en masse to embrace masks which was such a completely alien concept a year ago, is actually remarkable, particularly because in New York, mask wearing wasn't imposed by many rules or laws, as it was in other parts of the world, but instead by social norms. But in other cases, the issues of social and behavioural science were sadly ignored. And the converse of New York's mask wearing culture, which I do think has really helped to fight the pandemic, has been London, where essentially the behavioural science was ignored, the communication went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in a completely confusing way, and you ended up with a population that was so grumpy, so angry, that you had a flare-up towards late 2020, which was very damaging indeed for Britain. Well, I find the issue of high finance fascinating because I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. I did a PhD out in the mountains of Hindu Kush, in Tajikistan, looking at Tajik wedding rituals, which seems like an exotic type of topic that is utterly unrelated to Wall Street and Washington and things like that. But when I actually moved on in my career and ended up running the financial market section for the Financial Times, 
I was stunned by the degree to which a training in Tajik anthropology, um, a training that teaches you to look at everything and look at social silences, the part of the world we don't talk about, but which are often expressed through rituals and symbols, um, that's incredibly helpful for looking at bankers for several reasons. Firstly, because financiers make the mistake of thinking that finance is all about money and your algorithm and model can explain everything. The reality is that how money moves, what goes wrong with money, is also driven by all the social and cultural patterns that shape financiers who are operating as institutions. Your average investment bank is as tribal as any other society across the Hindu Kush. And you have all the tribal patterns playing out, which people often ignore or prefer to conceal from themselves and from others. The other problem, of course, is that financiers become beset with tunnel vision when they try and imagine the world of money. And they don't see the end users in the chain of any financial innovation they create or even have a joined up vision of how risks are building, which may be building in places that they avert their eyes from. There's a lot of debate right now about whether people actually need to be physically in an office or not to get their job done. And as you look at that question, it's worth thinking about one sector where there has been a complete paradox for the last 20 years in relation to that question. And that is finance. Because technically speaking, really around the turn of the century, financiers could have done a lot of their work at home because if you have a Bloomberg machine and a high-speed internet connection, you can trade. You can do a lot of what you need to simply sitting in your office. And yet, as an anthropologist called Daniel Bonzo has pointed out, at the very moment that all of these digital tools were coming on stream in the early years of the 21st century, banks on Wall Street and the City of London started building bigger and bigger trading floors to get more and more people into the office. So if you ask why that was, it becomes clear that what people are doing in offices is not just the work they think they're doing, which is looking at a computer screen and trading in disembodied markets. They're also engaged in something which call, anthropologists call incidental information exchange. And that's the process by which teams or groups or departments who already know each other well bump into other teams, other sources of information, and really widen their vision and their gaze and their net of information, which enables them to do their jobs. And that leads to another point, which is what anthropologists call sense-making. The idea that when we make decisions, we tell ourselves we're doing so on the basis of our wonderful linear rational thoughts or models, um, but actually we're absorbing information from our around, surroundings and environment and from other people the whole time which means that we often collectively almost make decisions as a group. And the reason why it's called sense-making is because there's a classic story from anthropology of the Truckees Polynesian sailors who essentially navigate vast distances across the sea, not by using GPS, which is what modern sailors do. You basically create a course and impose that on your environment to work out where you're going. They instead read the wind and the waves and the water and they smell their environment and they talk to each other and collectively plot a course by reacting to their environment. And so we all think in the office that we're acting like modern sailors with GPS and we are to a degree, but we're also acting like trucky sailors, essentially reading our environment and plotting a course collectively that way. And that's one reason why banks have big trading floors And also many people find that not being in the office robs them of something in terms of doing their jobs. My advice about how CEOs can embrace anthrovision or lessons from anthropology really falls into three key buckets. Firstly, using some anthropology helps you to understand your customers much better. And above all else, do something which is in some ways the simplest thing in the world, but actually the hardest thing in the world to actually implement, which is to recognize that other people don't think like you. 
It's so easy if you are a CEO or an aspiring executive who spends all their day basically in the office or working on a project to fall into the trap of assuming that other people have the same instincts and mentality as you. And it is so important in today's globalized world to recognize that is simply not true, to learn to basically walk in someone else's shoes and see the world differently. Because that way you both avoid risks, but you also see a new opportunities all over the place. But the second point is, you need to not just use AnthroVision to look at your own customers, clients or suppliers, but then to flip the lens and look back inside your own organization and see all the things that are hidden in plain sight, which are incredibly hard for insiders to see. There's this wonderful Chinese proverb that a fish can't see water. And it's very hard for us to see ourselves unless we step out of ourselves and look back afresh. The third area where anthropology is so helpful is in terms of recognizing that these bounded tunnel vision tools that we use to navigate the world in recent decades, like an economic model or big data set or corporate balance sheet are wonderful, but they are also limited. So that three part message is really at the core of what I think that AnthroVision can offer. Better understanding of other people outside your company who are your customers and clients, better appreciation of what's happening inside your company, and then also a realization about how you as a company sit within a wider ecosystem and why you have to widen that lens.